Okay, so uh, I'll get started with the introductions before the official hour begins to leave time for our uh, speakers. I'm uh, Paul Weiss from UCLA. Uh, sorry to arrive just uh, late last night after having to give a, an important talk for grants uh, in LA yesterday morning. So it's my uh, pleasure and honor to uh, chair the session. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Professor Dorit Aharonov from the Hebrew University. I actually like her original title better, which was, Should Chemists Fall for the Quantum Technology Hype? Uh, <laughs> she got her uh, degree at uh, Hebrew University uh, and then a PhD at Weizmann, did a postdoc at Berkeley, and then came to a spectacular uh, career here since uh, 2000. It's my pleasure to introduce her. Thanks. Thank you, Paul, for the very beautiful introduction. And uh, we'll just keep this title in mind in a superposition with the other one. Um, so, uh, oh, we're going that way. Um, so it's a pleasure and honor to be here. And thank you very much for inviting me uh, to this exciting event. And uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity for, pre uh, to present this uh, really remarkable uh, evolution of, of this field. Oh, but I want to see you. Um, no mic to... Okay, like this. Okay, maybe, maybe that will work. Okay, so um, um, thank you for the uh, opportunity to present uh, the remarkable achievements in this area, evolutions, and, and it really it's hard to escape quantum computation these days. Um, and hopefully... Uh, this will interest you, uh, as what I'm going to tell you about is, is about not exactly the, the quantum computation as a field, but really how it evolved into a field that has an incredible impact on quantum physics, and I think a, a lot of potential more impact on quantum physics in the future. So, um, so the whole field didn't start this way. Uh, the field started with basically the attempt to, to understand the, how the foundations of quantum mechanics can be combined with ideas of computation. And, um, and it's only at the early 90s there was a, a sequence of, of results. It often happens this way in science that um, very small incremental um, idea of, of, say, an improvement uh, here by Deutsch and Joza, or by Deutsch first, of where a computational step is saved, just a single computational step is saved by using a quantum information processor rather than a classical information processor. And this sequence, and from this, by a sequence of uh, improvements over two years, we got to this uh, amazing, groundbreaking discovery of a shore of, uh, um, of a quantum algorithm, assuming we have a quantum computer. Um, for factoring numbers, that is, you're given an, an integer n of described by n bits, little n bits, uh, that is logarithmic in large n, and you want to find the prime factors of that, and it turns out that the, there is a quantum algorithm for finding those prime factors in polynomial time in the size of uh, the presentation of the number, that is, in the size of, of the number of bits, uh, whereas any classical algorithm to do that takes exponential time. And this was groundbreaking and led many, many people, scientists, uh, physicists all over the world to try and build quantum computers. Um, but in my opinion, the, real, the really interesting part is not just the technological potential and the, the revolution that's standing in front of us, ahead of us, but also um, the amazing impact on, on, on physics, uh, where the penetration of the language of computation is sort of uh, really can be seen everywhere. Um, and it even gets to the very understanding of what's a physical experiment, like something from philosophy of science, and I'll touch upon that in, in later on. So, um, so to me, this is uh, what I would call the second quantum revolution, the, the penetration of the computational lens into quantum physics through notions like uh, computational hardness, simulations, error correction, approximation, communication, interaction, um, I'll, I'll give a hint to some of those during the talk. But to start with, I have to tell you what's a classical computation first. Um, or what's a computation? First of all, classical computation. And uh, it all started, I think, uh, with Edmonds about 60 years ago. Um, and Edmonds, so up till then, computation was considered a, 
uh, via the question of what can be computed. There are functions which can be computed, and there are functions which are just uh, undecidable. And Edmonds basically introduced this notion of complexity, of how fast we can compute a function, um, by introducing the notion of polynomial time. This was uh, really an insightful definition uh, in which he gave a way to really understand the complexity uh, of, of uh, solving a problem, the complexity of a problem. And the way he did that is he said, let's look at how the time for, for solving this problem scales with the size of the input. And he distinguished bet between the case in which it scales polynomially and the case in which it scales exponentially. And this difference might seem quantitative, but it's actually qualitative. You might, uh, get in, uh, you might see it by, lo by looking, for example, at phase transitions, where you see scaling which is exponential versus polynomial. And really, in, in computation, it, it, uh, you see it by saying that polynomial means that you see a structure in the problem, and exponential time means that you actually do brute force computation. So, so these, the distinction is really qualitative. And the point in classical computation is that, essentially, if you look at this resolution, all computational models look alike. They are all uh, based on the same idea of uh, that can be maybe best demonstrated by John Conway's Game of Life, um, in which there is a, you start with some initial configuration of living cells, and you update them locally by local rules. Each, each uh, cell is alive in the next step, uh, depending on the number of cells in its neighborhood that are alive, alive in the previous step. And from these simple update rules, you get immense complexity. That's the, the reason for the name, the Game of Life. Um, and you get universality. And the point is that all classical computational models, if you view them uh, through this polynomial time resolution, um, they all look alike. They're all based on the same idea, and um, they're all, in some, in this sense, equivalent. This is captured by the extended church Turing thesis that says that any physically realizable computational model can be simulated efficiently with polynomial overhead, that is, by a classical Turing machine. So by a classical computer. And this includes DNA computers and also uh, computers based on chaos, etc. And the, the essence of quantum computation is that it's, it seems, nothing is proven, to be violating this extended church Turing thesis. Okay, so uh, we think that quantum computation uh, does not obey this thesis. It cannot be simulated in polynomial time by a classical computer. And um, it's the only model that we know that credibly challenges this thesis. Okay, so, so how does it do that? Where does its power come from? It comes, and a very essential ingredient is in the exponentiality of, um, of the Hilbert space. Um, yeah. um, so n quantum particles and um, with two states, these are n qubits, um, are described by, well, each particle multiplies the dimension of the Hilbert space by a factor of two. So uh, a general state in this uh, system is described by a superposition over two to the n possible classical configurations. And this is a mind-boggling difference between classical information and quantum information. And uh, this difference between the size of the description, between linear and uh, exponential size, is, uh, is really... Uh, um, hard to, to imagine for 300 bits, 300 qubits, you need more than the number of particles in the universe to describe the state, to describe a general state. And this is what led uh, Feynman and uh, independently Yuri Manin and Benoit uh, to suggest, well, quantum systems are hard to simulate. Um, maybe they harness, maybe we can harness them as computational devices because they do something very interesting computationally. So maybe you can use that. Um, and, okay, so how do we harness the, the complexity of, of such systems uh, for computation? Well, the model, like the classical model, you need some kind of elementary steps that together accumulate by, by uh, concatenating them, by composing many of them, you get complexity. But here, locality is different. Here it's locality in the physical system, it's not locality in the Hilbert space. Um, and so, um, and so the model of computation will be that you have n quantum bits. These are uh, these red dots and the wires correspond to, the, to uh, these qubits evolving in time. And uh, so time goes that way. 
And um, the, the blue boxes are the gates. These are local gates, local operations, acting on, say, one or two qubits at a time. So uh, the quantum algorithm would be, you start from some input state, which is simple. Say each qubit is set to zero or one in the beginning, in a tensor product state. And then you let it evolve by local dynamics, some local Hamiltonian uh, that generates some unitary matrix evolution. And, and then you measure each qubit at the end, is it zero or one? And uh, the quantum gates that you can apply, well, for one qubit gates, for example, you can think of a not gate that changes between the two states of the particle from zero to one. Uh, or the Hadamard gate, which rotates this uh, state by 45 degrees uh, from 0 to a superposition of 0 plus 1, or any rotation in the Bloch sphere. That's, these are single qubit gates. So you can apply operations on each one of the qubits, but of course this will, if you start from a product state, you will stay in a product state. So uh, you need some entangling gate to create general unitaries of n qubits. So here is an, an example of a gate uh, the details don't matter. Um, this is a gate that conditioned on the first qubit being something, it does something else to the other qubit. Um, but essentially any two qubit gate, almost any two qubit gate would suffice to generate universal um, computation, meaning to generate all, to approximate all possible unitaries on n qubits. And the complexity here, again, like before, you, you are interested in what can be done with polynomially many such quantum gates acting on n qubits? Um, okay, so what indeed can be done? Um, so, okay, so first of all, you can do anything that can be done classically, because uh, any function that can be computed classically by some elementary set of gates, a classical gate can be replaced by a quantum gate uh, by remembering the input, it is reversible, and therefore it's unitary. Okay, that's not a big deal. But then, what happens if you start by applying the Hadamard gate on each one of the qubits, and therefore you get a superposition over all possible strings, and then you apply the classical computation, then you get exponential parallelism, because the bilinearity of quantum mechanics, the function is computed over all inputs at once. That looks amazing, but really that is not the reason for the quantum advantage, because if you try and measure this state, you just collapse the whole thing. So you lost the, the exponential parallelism. So where does it come from? You need to be much more clever. And luckily, they're very clever, some very clever people in the field. And for example, um, Shor's algorithm starts with this idea, but then with a particular f, never mind exactly what, um, measures that second register, the right register, and gets a very comp a very interesting superposition, which is exponential. The details here don't matter, just to give you a sense of what's going on. You got a superposition uh, which is periodic, and the period is what you want to find. Now, it's an exponential superposition over the two to the n possible state, strings, and to discover the period, you can't do by just measuring because it, it has a random shift. But what turns out to be possible is that the Fourier transform can be performed very efficiently on this exponentially large superposition. It can be performed by a quantum computer in polynomially many steps. And with the Fourier transform, you get a superposition which is concentrated on the harmonics, and this is how you discover this uh, period that you want to discover. So with these ideas, you can, uh, you can do Shor's algorithm, and actually we don't have many other ideas. I mean, there are a few, but there are not enough. But still, we have several very beautiful examples for quantum algorithms, um, which give exponential speedups over anything that we know classically. Now, OK, this is, this is very beautiful. One of, the, one of the things that I think would, uh, is, is one of the possible applications of quantum computation, uh, not for computational problems, but, but for problems that might interest you guys, is that a quantum computer not only can do this, but it can also simulate any physical evolution that happens for polynomial time and give the right output. So whatever physical or uh, quantum chemistry uh, process that you have in mind, a quantum computer will be able to simulate that in polynomial overhead. 
Okay, so that's another thing which seems to give exponential overhead, exponential speed up over any possible classical algorithm that we know. Okay, so, so to give the computational complexity map of, of what we know by now, well, um, there is this, uh, so computer scientists like to give acronyms. So uh, um, I, I'll be, I'll spare you uh, with most of them, but just to give you a sense of this, um, it, it's useful to have these acronyms. So BQP is the class of problems solvable in polynomial time by quantum computers. That's, that stands for bounded quantum polynomial time. And this is sort of the class of problems that are tractable by a quantum computer. And BBP is the same, but when the computer is now classical with some access to random bits. And P is the same, but the classical computer with no access to random bit, no quantumness. And so these classes behave like that. We strongly believe that BBP and P are the same, but we also strongly believe that BQP and BBP are different, meaning that these problems lie in this area that is in BQP, but not in BBP. I call it the high complexity regime of quantum mechanics. And, and okay, so this strong belief that quantum computers violate the extended church Turing thesis, um, it actually stands on two things. One is that we strongly believe that BQP is different than BBP as a mathematical conjecture. But we also strongly believe that these quantum systems can be physically implemented um, in reality. I don't know how strongly strongly believe this, but this is the reason why people invest so much money in this and uh, so much time. And um, one of the reasons, or maybe a central reason, is this uh, quantum correcting codes and, uh, and fault tolerance theorems, which say that uh, if the error is below, if the local error rate is below a certain threshold, you can do everything as if, as if there's no errors with just a small overhead. So, so, what, so the upshot here is that quantum mechanics is believed to violate this extended church theory thesis saying that all computational models are the same and offers a model which, is, which in polynomial time seems to be capable of doing things that are not possible in polynomial time to, for classical computers. Okay, so this we have to erase. We have to get rid of this extended church Turing thesis. And the thing that replaces this is uh, very naturally the quantum extended church Turing thesis, which says that any physically realizable computational model, and you should read here, any physically realizable evolution, can be simulated in polynomial time by a quantum computer. This is not to say, uh, so this thesis we strongly believe in. Now, this is not to say that, uh, maybe I should say a sentence about what does it mean to strongly believe in. Um, computer scientists uh, strongly believe in things uh, that are not proven because we don't know how to prove many, many things. But we should treat many of these strong beliefs as if, I mean, it is possible to treat these things as if they're physical laws. And there are reasons to, to think about them as physical laws because of, uh, because of, a lot of intuition and attempts to, to understand this map. And indeed, one of the physical laws, uh, quote, quote, that we believe in is that this BQP class, or anything that can be done in polynomial time uh, in our physical quantum world, cannot solve what's called NP hard problems. NP problems are those problems, which I'm sure you've all heard at least the, buzz, the, the word, um, these are problems that if you get, you're given the solution, you can check that it's correct, but without, this, uh, uh, without being given the solution, it might be very hard to find. Like, for example, uh, um, a low energy a st uh, a configuration with very small energy below some given number of the Ising model, so the classical Ising model. I'm giving it to you, I'm giving you the configuration, you can check it, but without this, it might be extremely hard to find, exponentially hard to find. Okay, now there's also this class of quantum NP, which is, um, which sort of is like NP, but, it, uh, but the solution can be quantum. For example, a superposition corresponding to the ground state of a local Hamiltonian, um, and you wanna check that it is really, the energy is small. If you're given the ground state, it might be easy to measure, but without this ground state, finding the ground state might take a long time, very long time. Okay, so we strongly, believe there are sort of, the picture is that uh, BQP is the tractable set of, of problems and everything outside is not possible. And the thing is that we, we um, 
quantum computation complexity looks at, at this map and tries to understand what's going on here by looking at, at uh, first of all, what can be done inside DQP, and secondly, uh, looking at hints at, about what is impossible, no-go theorems, about understanding what, is, what lies there in quantum NP and NP outside of BQP, and to give, us, to give us hints about what we shouldn't try. And interestingly enough, the, the, the two researchers, research directions, which seem unrelated, are tightly related. Um, and so, okay, so, so this research has led to many different uh, ideas penetrating physics, and I'm just going to spend the last uh, third of my talk uh, giving you uh, sort of a flavor of two of those uh, presents coming from this computational lens to physics. Um, and the first one is the notion of interactive experiment, and the second one is this concept of quantum NP and what it tells us about no-go results. Okay, so the first, the first thing I find uh, mind-boggling, in fact, uh, um, it is uh, related to the very interesting discussion that uh, Rudy Marcus, uh, at the end of Rudy Marcus' talk uh, yesterday, um, we heard about this uh, notion of the difference between understanding and uh, knowing. And I think this has something to say about it, something interesting. So, so how, okay, so, so let me start by uh, describing the problem. What's a physical experiment in the most schematic way? So here at how it looks like to a theoretician. Um, there is an experiment and uh, there is a theory and you want to test the theory. Um, this is the theory you want to test, you have some hypothesis. You initiate the, uh, the physical system with some initial conditions and you let it evolve and then uh, you take the theory and you calculate the prediction of what it says for the experiment, and then you compare the two. And that's the predict and compare paradigm. If the comparison fails, you have to change something. Okay, so that's sort of the most, uh, the, the, the schematic way an experiment works. But if you look at it closely and if you've listened to what I said before closely, uh, you, would say, you would understand that this is impossible to do in the quantum world for many, many body systems, because um, if you replace this by quantum mechanics, then this side of the, of the picture, the, the prediction, is impossible to do for many body systems. So, um, so we cannot make the predictions in general. So that says that many body quantum physics cannot be tested. These evolutions cannot be tested in the predict and compare paradigm because we cannot generate the predictions. Okay, so that creates a big puzzle, um, which leads to, I think, uh, three very interesting questions. First, is quantum mechanics a falsifiable theory for many body systems? That's the first question. Um, how can an experimentalist who is attempting to build a quantum computer really know that this is what uh, she's actually creating? And uh, cryptographically, how can we safely delegate computations to a company, uh, say Q-Wave, who's claiming to, to, uh, to do some quantum computation, and uh, we don't know if it's correct or not? So this is, these are really disturbing questions. And uh, however, uh, if you're alert, you, you would have noticed that actually I've given uh, an example of an experiment that's outside that sort of contradicts this line of thought, which is Shor's algorithm. Um, Shor's algorithm is, in fact, you can view it as a physical experiment that does test quantum mechanics outside of the BPP regime in the high complexity regime. So in that, in that regime, we shouldn't be able to do experiments. So how, how, how come <laughs> there is an experiment that does this um, test. I mean, we didn't yet run it, but at least on, on paper. Um, so the reason is that Shor's algorithm actually is not in the predict and compare paradigm. It is slightly out of it, but this little uh, deviation will tell us a lot. And uh, the way it will tell us a lot is, that is, the, is through the connection to a very interesting direction concept from theoretical computer science, which is called interactive proofs. So this concept was born completely unrelated to experiments 
in, with the motivation, was born in the mid-80s, with a motivation in mind of understanding the very concept of a, phys of a mathematical proof uh, in, a, in a very unrealistic model. You have an all-powerful prover who knows whether a, theor a theorem is correct or not, mathematical theorem, knows the proof, and wants to convince me, a, a, weak comp a computationally weak verifier, of the correctness of the proof, but uh, I don't trust this guy. So the question is, can I be convinced? Can I reach a situation in which I know that the, that the proof is correct, that the theorem is correct, <coughs> um, by interacting with this prover? And what these guys noticed is this uh, very beautiful observation that, yes, if you add interactions and randomness um, to this process, the all-powerful prover can convince a weak verifier of the correctness of a claim that the weak verifier could not have reached on her own, could not have proved on her own. So, um, so this is uh, this led first of all mathematically. This can be written as the theorem that says that uh, with interactive proofs, the prover can convince the verifier of this highly complex claims sitting in the class P space. Never mind what that is, but it's really far away from P um, and also out of NP and, uh, and away. So, uh, so, okay, so, so what, why, why, why is that helping? Uh, I mean, why would randomness and interaction help in this process? Um, let me give you a story that will explain this. Um, suppose I'm a magician. I know how to count the number of leaves in a tree in the blink of an eye. Um, you don't believe me, and you want to test me. So, uh, okay, ask me how many leaves are there in the tree outside, and look at it through the window, nine billion. You don't believe me, you have a way to test me, go out and, and uh, count the number of leaves, that will take you forever, but you have a different way to test me, which is using randomness and interaction. What you'll do is, um, you'll, you'll ask me to turn around, Pick a random number between, say, 1 and 10, and tear off that number of leaves from the tree, and then ask me to tear, turn around again and tell you again how many leaves are there in the tree. And if there are 9 billion, if I tell you 9 billion minus the number you picked, then you start being suspicious. You might try again and again and again, and if I succeed all the times, and if you make sure that I haven't peaked, that would be for you a convincing way to, to, to be convinced, a convincing process that convinces you of the fact that I really know how to count, um, that I really know how to count, um, but, uh, but it will, uh, um, no, that took me off just a moment, um, um, that I really know how to count, but, uh, but you will not know what, uh, how I did that. Okay, so with the same idea, um, that touches upon this uh, uh, conversation that I talked about, about understanding and knowing versus being convinced. And with the same idea, we can do uh, the same thing with quantum computations. It turns out that, that Shor's algorithm is exactly in this paradigm, except that the prover is replaced by a quantum computer, and, um, and in Shor's algorithm, the verification process is very simple. It just takes the two primes and multiply them. But if you add more interactions and randomness, you can actually get convinced of anything that any polynomial time evolution that happens in the quantum world, even though you don't understand it. And we might, I think this actually says that we will need to sort of give up on understanding general quantum evolutions and just be able to be convinced of them. And so I think this is, I won't go into how you do that, but I think finding other interactive and other places where interactive experiments can be used in other contexts is, is a very interesting um, direction to look at. Let me just say, spend one minute on the other side of, of what's impossible, no-go theorems, about quantum NP. I didn't really have time to, to describe it. I, I, in fact, didn't mean to describe it fully. But as I said, NP is the class of problems that when given a solution, you can... Uh, check that it is a good solution, but without it, it may be very, very hard to find. Quantum NP is the same thing, but with a quantum solution. And the mother problem for that is the local Hamiltonian problem. You're given a local Hamiltonian, you want to find its ground energy, 
it's extremely hard to find its ground energy, but given the ground state, you will be able to measure it and also to verify that it is true. So these are problems that, in the worst case, are extremely hard. And what can we learn from them? Okay, what can we learn from this these QMA hardness results? So here are classes of QMA hardness hard uh, instances, the Heisenberg model, the Hubbard model, even one-dimensional um, local Hamiltonians are QMA hard. I'm finishing. Um, but from that, what can we can learn from the hardness? Well, we shouldn't expect a classical efficient description of these ground states because these ground states are uh, quantum NP hard, so they should be quantum. And we shouldn't expect that the system relaxes in polynomial time to its ground state because otherwise it will solve a quantum NP complete problem. So in general, it doesn't. And what might be interesting for chemists is that even finding the universal density functional turns out to be QMA hard, so we shouldn't be able to do that um, if we really believe this picture of impossibility. Okay, so to sum up, I think there are many, many presents that could come from, from uh, this computational lens, and I've only told you about two of them, but there's also sensing and super resolution and many other directions where, uh, where these notions uh, uh, could lead to new concepts, and I'll thank you for your attention. Question or comment? Yes. Since you put it up, could you say something about sensing and super resolution? Um, I can say a word about it. That um, um, there is an idea uh, that you can use quantum error correction to actually correct the system while you're measuring it. And since you're correcting it while you're measuring it, you're in increasing the length of the coherence time, and then the precision increases. And there are other ideas where you can, which also come from computational ideas and lead to better and better precisions. Yes, quick question here. It's probably a very naive question. Ye years ago, people were discussing another kind of, let's call it partly quantum computer, and it's simply based on interference between light beams. This interference means that you have something like a qubit. As far as I can see, this cannot have entanglement. I don't know why the effort to build such a computer has ceased almost completely. Don't these have important advantages over just standard classical computers while being relatively easy to build? So uh, there are two answers to this. One is that uh, if you just use the systems that you're talking about, you will need exponentially many modes, and that uh, puts aside the exponential advantage. But in fact, there is a, um, a protocol for using linear optics um, by, uh, by Milborn and friends uh, that, that does use optics in order to generate universal quantum computation. And this, this is an ongoing research. This is an ongoing attempt to build quantum computers. But it's classical. In other words, it, it doesn't really perform as a quantum computer, but it's classical. What is classical? That proposition, that idea to, to do an optical computer, or let's say even all optical No, no, the KLM is definitely perform, quantum. That perform, will perform as a quantum computer, it will perform as a classical computer, not as a quantum uh, We'll fight after that. <laughs> I don't agree. Actually, I have a question. Is there something better than a random search in your iterative uh, 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 testing that you suggested? Is there a way to make the most diverse set of inquiries to uh, assess? Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. This the whole the whole idea in this interactive protocol is is that this thing is done in a clever way. Otherwise, uh, otherwise it won't really help. And uh, so, so the 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 protocol that I gave here is very, very simplistic. In fact, the protocol is adaptive and you need to change the, the questions depending on the answers coming from the prover and it's very complex. Okay, well let's thank, oh, one last question here and we'll bring up our next speaker while we're. A comment on your statement that uh, the exact functional of DFT to construct it is an NP hard problem. QMA hard. While this is true, 
it is still possible to do an exact cohen sham calculation. An exact what? An exact cohen sham calculation, so an exact DFT calculation, mm -hmm. also in practice. And the reason for this is that in order to do this, you do not need the functional for all possible densities, but only for those that appear in the iteration. And that's an infinite sequence, but that's not all densities that you can think of. So, so it does not preclude an actual exact DFT calculation. Let's talk about it afterwards. I, don't, I want to understand it better. All right. Well, let's thank Professor Aronoff again. Thank you.